So as usual, every week we do an unboxing. Mark came to me with a wonderful idea. And he goes, Roman, how about, rather than taking just the stuff that came in, let's go popular brands and pick the most underrated watches from popular selling brands, which is a bit of an oxymoron, right? So we have Rolexes and Paddocks and APs, right? One of your hottest selling brands, but yet there are still watches within that genre that are actually underrated. And Mark helped me pick out the rest of the watches. So this time, we're gonna get a case, not multiple boxes. So I'm gonna get this open. Uh, is there any particular one you want to start with, Marco? Um, I think we start with probably the most undervalued gold sports watch from a high horology brand, and that is Patek Philippe. And I would go with the reference 3700J. The reason being, and this was something that you brought up uh, when we were picking uh, which watches to go with because uh, of the price point of this one, right? 175. Today, market value on a 5711 rose gold on a bracer is what, 185? Yeah, around 185. Okay. Yeah. Depending year and condition. My biggest take on this when it comes to value or being underrated, I should say, right? And it kind of goes hand in hand, if you will, mm -hmm. is the fact that this is a true collectible, a 5711 rose gold or steel or 5712 or any of the new current Nautiluses is a manufactured collectible. Sure. Meaning numbers, how many of these were produced? 1,500 roughly. Ruff yes. Roughly yeah. 1,500 pieces produced. How many 5711s do you think Paddock made? A lot more. <laughs> a lot, yeah. And when I, we say a lot more, it's a lot more. I mean, it's it's in the hundreds of thousands. Yeah, we're talking about like a, about a 20 year production span on the 3700. If they made about 1,500, you know, we're talking, you know, a few, few hundred at most uh, per year, right? Versus a 5711, you know, they were making upwards of 40 to 60,000 at any given time during its production span. So yeah, it's, it's a, definitely a lot more. So my thing is this, especially when it comes to, the, it's so true for the 5711 versus the 3700J, is because it's literally exactly the same watch. Yeah. One is older, one is vintage, one is collectible. And yeah, guys have to think of it this way too. If there were 1500 made, let's assume, right? Give or take. How many of them survived? Sure. Okay, because believe it or not, if you go back to the 70s and the early 80s, Watches from that era simply sometimes didn't even survive. For somebody paid a couple of hundred, couple, couple of grand for this thing back in the day, three, four thousand yeah. dollars, and decided that the watch is disposable and just got the hell rid of it or melted it for its gold value. Yeah. How many times did I hear Gary say he melted more Paul Newman Daytona? <laughs> yeah, than my I partner did Gary, my partner Gary uh, used to have a pawn shop in the early '80s in Atlantic City. He literally melted gold Daytonas, gold yeah. Paul Newmans yeah. that are worth, my God, I don't even want to know what they're worth, but. That era of time, you're talking about 70s, early 80s to mid 80s, you know, the solid gold Piaget Polos, those things got melted for the price of gold. Yep. So a lot of these things didn't even survive. Then you're talking about condition, the fact that it's working, whether it's complete and so on, and, and the pool just keeps on shrinking. So to me, I, I never understood why somebody would go for a 5711 rose gold, you know, that there's ample of versus a 3700J, and that's what makes it so underrated for I me. Think, I think also you have to mention the fact that it's a vintage watch. It will always have that unmistakable charm, right? That soul that is inherent with time. Right? You can't get that from a modern watch. Soul that's inherent with time. Yeah, like the we gotta soul that- We yeah, gotta make a reel out no, of that. We gotta make a reel out of that. Like a, a watch develops a soul, a character over time, and you can't buy that, you can't, you know, you can't make that, uh, the only thing that you can allow for it is we're the gonna development be, We're gonna be time. celebrating the 50th anniversary of this watch in a couple in, of years. Yeah, it's, a couple of years, crazy. two years is coming. What do you wanna go to next, Marco? I think I would say uh, something by, uh, by its Holy Trinity counterpart, and that's AP. And this is a 26331 ST, this one in particular, with the blue dial. Now, obviously the Royal Oak is a very, very popular watch on the market, but you know, they make Royal Oaks in all shapes and sizes, literally. Uh, and physically. Well, I wouldn't say shapes, I would say sizes. Yeah, it definitely in all shape sizes. Shape is the same. <laughs> yeah, the, sh the shape is the same, you're right. So so in terms of the actual watch itself, the reason I picked this is because this was a watch that was trading at the peak of the market, probably over 85,000. And this is one that's now trading in the mid to low 40s, you know, pending year and condition. An example like this is a little bit older, 2019, so we're asking uh, lower 40s, which for a blue dial, Royal Oak, and you add the complication of a chronograph, that's less than, for example, a stainless steel jumbo, even a reference. Now I see where you're going, because when you put that in the case, I'm like, yeah. where's he going to go with this one? But I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Now, funny story about this watch. So my son, when he graduated high school, 423 GPA, got into every college he applied to, to include Northeastern University, which is like damn near impossible to get into nowadays. And you know, as a gift, me and Anna decided to give him an expensive watch. Now, mind you, he bought his first Rolex at the age of 16 because mm -hmm. he's been running his business since he was 14 years old, so he could afford it. Uh, and I said, okay, I'm gonna get him a Blue Dial Royal Oak. 
Now the retail on the watch is 28 and change with mm -hmm. tax comes out to like whatever, 30, 31, 31,000 sure. or something like that, right? Uh, I called in a favor, somebody I've done business with in the past who happens to be an AP deal, I said, look, this is personal, this is not for business, going to my son, he charged me retail, no questions asked. At that time, that watch was trading at 90 grand. Yeah. My son gets the gift and you know, we all have internet. He's like, dad, this is insane. He's like, you just, that's, that's crazy. I can't be wearing this watch. I'm like, listen, it's the hype of the market. You know, it's the, we're in the height of the market. You know, they'll probably come down to, you know, whatever they're going to come down to. But at the end of the day, that's not what I paid. I paid, right. I got a fair price on it. So don't look at it as that way. Look at it as a timeless gift. And he's, he still wears it soundly. Like he's uncomfortable wearing it. Because yeah. my son is weird in that way. Like he didn't buy it himself. So he's like, you know, should, am I the guy that should be wearing, you know, a $50,000 watch? I get it when you're uncomfortable in the space, right? Like when you go from, you know, I think as a Samaritan, right? Yeah, Samaritan, yeah, yeah sub, sub date to, you know, an AP Royal Crown guy, especially at the, the height of the market, you know, the wearing such an expensive watch can be uncomfortable at if the you're not used At the to. time he bought a sub, you know, they were trading a little bit over list. They weren't going crazy yet. They went, I think at the peak, what did a what did ceramic sub reach? Um, like almost 18. Almost 18,000, yeah, now almost they're 18, where at? Where right, they right around 15. Right about 15, right? So at the time, I think they were trading around 12 and retail, I think it was 92.50 if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken. Uh, and again, he told me, Dad, I want to buy my first watch. I sent him an AD. Well, I've known for many, many years, and he gave it to him a cost. He bought his Rolex at 37 off retail. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's so, awesome. So that but yeah, no, I, just just to kind of uh, finish off with this, I just think AP Royal Oak chronographs are some of the most underrated in the Royal Oak range. You look at the 38 millimeter chronos, even if you go back in time, right, the 39. The 38 never, I don't know, for me, the perfect size is 39. The, so if you go back to the 39 millimeter chronos, I'm forgetting the reference, but I think it's a 25860, something like that, right? Uh, I think those are some of the best value Royal Oaks. Like you, the 15300, the 15, uh, the, the yeah, chronograph. Yeah, 15300. All, all of them. Chrono even, like, even the power reserve, I love. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. The, the dual time. The dual time, yeah. Dual time, dual time awesome. power reserve. Yep. I'm going to stay, if you don't mind, I know you've been running the show here, but I'm going to I'm gonna stay within the designer realm because yeah. this is all Genta pieces, obviously, 1972, 1976. Do you remember the date on this? I don't know. I think it was also in the 70s. I think it would have been around it was somewhere, the 70s. It was yeah. somewhere around the 70s. And what I'm going to is I'm going to the Cartier Pasha. Now, I'm going to give the reason why I picked it is because we want to go in the right. range. But I'm yeah. going to let you talk about why. Because you picked that watch. Why do you feel that that's uh, undervalued within the range of watches? Well, I think that the answer is twofold, right? One of them is, you mentioned it's Gerald Genta design, right? When you think Gerald Genta, you think Royal Oak, you think Nautilus. I mean, you can even go, for example, to the Bulgari Octo Finissimo. You can go to, um, you know, for example... Uh, the oh, and Ingenieur, Ingenieur uh, Universal. We can go back to the 60s. We can go to the Midas. Right, but almost nobody ever mentions the Pasha. Cartier Pasha. And You're then right. you go even into Cartier's range. Nobody ever really mentions the Pasha within Cartier's range. They say Tank and Santos. Uh, you know. Now the, go, go on and on. But, but. <clears throat> the the slightly larger newer Santos skeletons is all the rage right now. Sure. Although yeah. they did this in an XL a few years back, that never really took off, and I'm still shocked why. It but didn't, but the, the newer Santos models are, are trading really well, but they, they made this in a, in a couple different dial variants. They made it for ladies, for men's, they made it even in a skeleton, and I think it's a great design and such an undervalued Cartier, especially being a Genta design. Especially having the pedigree of Gerald Genta. Yeah. You, you want a quick story? Because you know I have stories. Yeah, talk to me. All right, so the very, very first fancy watch I've ever bought my wife, expensive watch, was a Cartier Pasha 38 millimeters, non-chrono with a grill. Remember how they had the grill? Oh yeah, the grill, the, yeah, the, 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 the remove, flaps. Yeah. They actually removed it. Sure. It came with a little tool that was like tic-tac-toe. You could yeah. actually, that was the first fancy watch that I've ever, ever bought my wife. Also, if you want to go back to my immigration, uh, when I was a young kid, before I could afford watches, you know, all the guys that had a little bit of money, the watch they went to, Cartier Pasha, Cartier yeah. Pasha, Cartier Pasha, Corona, even the quartz ones. Remember they had the quartz ones? Those are if the they, roadsters, right? Yeah. I think the roadsters. No, the roadsters were came later. Okay, they came but later. But the Cartier Pasha, so you think about Gary's generation, Alex, yeah. our jeweler Alex, see they're, they're friends mm -hmm. in the same generation. Back then, the Flex was the gold Santos, the smaller ones. They had them in two tones and they were the tiny ones, right? Because it was, the watches weren't big back yeah. then. It was that, that my, genera was that my generation coming up, it was the Pasha and it was the bigger Pasha because <laughs> they had them in 33 millimeters. So the girls would get the 33 millimeters and the guys would get the 38 millimeter chronos usually. And that was, oh my God, if he had a stainless steel Cartier Pasha with the Sapphire Cabochons, because, you know, especially with the chrono. Yeah. If you had it with the grill, oh my God, end <laughs> of conversation. So we're done with. Uh, we're done with Genta stuff, and again, we didn't do this purposely. I just decided to go to it. Can we go to the King of One Watch? Can we go to Rolex? Yeah, let's because, do Rolex. Because I am, I am, you know, again, Market did most of the picking on these watches. He's the one that came up with the steam, and I thought it was very, very interesting. 
Tell me about the root beer. What happened? Yeah, I mean, this is a watch that now trades significantly under retail. I think it's definitely undervalued also because of the release of the new yellow gold GMT. But I would say this yellow or so let's start. What's the retail? Uh, the retail is right around 40,000. This is what's trading at right like, pending year and condition under. So we're talking like 38,000, uh, maybe a little bit less uh, again. But it's been like that for a minute because remember we did the video about Rolex is trading on the list. It's been just sitting there. So so it's been holding its value very well, but I feel like the, the main point is really gold Rolex right now. But specifically, if you're looking at the sports professional line, something like a Submariner, Sky Dweller, GMT, I like the GMT the best. I'm biased towards. I think it's the best watch Rolex makes because it just defines the entire GMT genre. And when right? you said that, does, the, are you saying that same holds for let's say the Rose on Rose Sky Dweller? Oh yeah, and, I, and, and, and maybe not the Rose Gold Sky Dweller, but certainly the Yellow Gold. Um, even if you go back further, you go to the White Gold. Um, even like if you go to the Rose Gold with the Roman dial, those mm -hmm. are really undervalued nowadays. But I, I just love this ruby. I think you're getting an all gold Rolex with a complication under retail price, it's a no-brainer. It's a stainless steel Daytona Panda today, the new style. Uh, new style, actually, I just sold one recently for 37,000. It's gonna be approximately versus, the same price. That. Yeah, that's you know, a great comparison. There are, there are yeah. so many moments in our careers where we take certain watches and put them side by side. Like, we take a Baba Watson and put it side by side by, with an AP Grand Complication, sure. you're like, what gives, right? But again, it's a matter of preference. One of the things that people that look at this market as an investment market and look at watches mainly as an investment rather than looking as a passion asset or an expensive toy first and foremost is one thing I always tell people that look if you're if you're going to compare this to the S&P 500 like some of the big networks did mm -hmm. I'm like you one thing you have to consider is like and there are trends in stock markets as well like certain people follow certain trends right but for the most part this is a physical item that is a stylish item that is a trendy item. So trends change, and that's the one, that's the one left hook that you run into sometimes when it comes to watches is trends, right? And availability on the market, right? You know, you can buy stocks indefinitely for the most part, right? But at the end of the day, you have to consider that a, hey, we went through a big, big boom, a big boom over yeah. the last three years with COVID and everything else, and end result is a lot of these out of the market, right? Mm -hmm. And again. It's going to trickle down eventually because, again, just because there's a lot of them on the market, they still sell, they still go on people's wrists, and people actually keep them. Right? Yeah, but I mean, when you make the comparison, like for me, getting an all gold root beer versus a steel Panda Daytona, like there's, the, no, the, there's no comparison. Yeah, there's from value, for, there's no comparison. From, so I see why you went there. Yeah, absolutely not. Let me let me scale down in price a little bit because you picked the Tudor Daytona. Yeah. <laughs> like it. the sister company to Rolex, obviously Tudor has made tremendous strides and because of their Black Bay range, right? Uh, I would say it's probably helped provide the brand because in 20, you know, the, the they almost closed it down. T Tudor was pretty much dead, yeah. right? It, it just was, and the Black Bay really revived the range. And when you think Tudor Black Bay, people tend to go to you know the Black Bay 58, even the new Black Bay like Burgundies on the Jubilee ba bracelet. Uh, the Black Bay Pro, which is a good size, the GMT, but no one really ever talks about the Chrono, I feel like, and specifically the Black Dial, because now there's a watch you're going to pick up all day long under $4,000, and we're talking about a watch that has a movement uh, that's actually made in collaboration with Breitling. So Breitling, uh, and the modern kind of Navitimer chronographs and that kind of stuff, will use the same, iconic watch. the same movement as this, and yet the retail is significantly less. Uh, and then not to mention, obviously, I would say personally, the Tudor build quality is as good, if not- It's got the Rolex, it's got the Rolex build. I mean. If not arguably better, right? The, the quality of the bracelets, the quality of the materials is just second to none. I absolutely love this. Listen, I can't pull off the size personally. I think it's a little bit too big, but it, it doesn't take anything away from the watch. I think you know it's the funny part value. is like, I remember starting out in the business and Tudor was like, this, a lot of people will ask me questions about certain micro brands and stuff like that. I have zero knowledge of it because I never traded it, I never dealt with them. And I, I'm usually honest in my DMs and I say, look, sorry, this is not something I've ever had my hands on. I couldn't give you a proper yeah. opinion, so to speak, right? And while we were in, I was starting out a business, we looked at Tudor as like a micro brand. Like we looked yeah. at them the same way as we would look at Tissot. And in no offense to Tissot, I actually like the brand, right? right? I like the stuff that they make, but you know, you have levels. Right? Yeah, it's like an, a, a and slightly to, higher end entry and to, level and, watch. And Tudor, to me, it, it was it was almost like that micro brand, right? As they call it, a, not, I want to say fashion watch, but I say micro brand, right? Yeah. Like Tissot or things of that nature, right? And still high quality watches, there's different price points. And it, again, as you said, it's only as of recent that, uh, you know, these things uh, started going up and 
What I love that you mentioned is the following. You, you feel the bracelet, you look at the case. It doesn't feel like a maker or brand watch because oftentimes to fit into a price point of a Tissot, which trades under a thousand dollars, you right. sacrifice things. Yeah, you, you sacrifice sac bracelets, you sacrifice quality of the case, you sacrifice certain things. They're just not made as well because it's more expensive to do so. And I, I'm telling you, Tudor has knocked it out of the park. I think they're here to stay. And I think they will never come out of the shadow of that other cheaper Rolex. Yeah. However, it's, it's impossible real collectors are understanding the value that they're getting. The, they'll always be connected to Rolex. At the end of the day, they're a sister company. But I mean, for example, I even made the comparison to Breitling, but compared to another great 42 millimeter chronograph, the Speedmaster, right? This trades at a fraction of the price, and yet it's still the same Aesthetically, size. Aesthetically, it's a good and, looking watch too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, with the introduction of Black Bay, I think that went like vintage Yeah, if you will. Very like, a little more, um, A little more rugged, a little more military feel. And I think they did a great job with that. Now, this is another surprise for me. Uh, you pulled out an Aquanaut. Yeah, I, I picked this one specifically only for one reason. The reason is the bracelet, yeah. right? Because it comes with the bracelet, um, you know, it's gonna be significantly less desirable, I guess, than the rubber strap model. The cool thing actually about uh, the modern ones is now you can take off the bracelet and put it on a rubber strap. This is the one thing I never understood. So uh, let's just be fair here. This was never the most popular bracelet. Yeah. The Aquanaut bracelet, At all. I was not a fan of it. I thought it was a little too thick. It was a bit reminiscent to me of a Gerard Perigo bracelet. They made their sports models like the Ferrari watches with the same mm -hmm. type of bracelet. And it's not tapered. There's just a lot of things about those bracelet that I can find wrong. Right. Yeah. It's I just mean, an like, old even, fashioned like it's, even it's with dated. these, even with these two watches side by too. side, like you can literally say, like, like if you took this bracelet off and put it on here, I feel like it'd be a better look, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'm not talking about, like, say, the Nautilus bracelet, which I never understood. Why not go with a Nautilus bracelet on this? I think it's because the Aquana already gets the whole like it's a discount Nautilus reputation. You know, you don't yeah, want you, to. You, you, probably, you, probably, you don't. You, probably you, don't right. you don't want to do that. But I, I agree with you. I think the bracelet. This I've is seen, a little I, bit dated. I've seen, well. I, see, I see the disparity between the bracelet model and the rubber strap model is so little because this is less popular and the rubber is more popular. So the price points are usually damn near the same. Yep. And I've always said to people, I'm like, spend that tiny little bit more because it's fractionally more, like just a little bit. And then order the rubber strap. Yeah, the or, rubber strap is like a thousand, like yeah, a few hundred. Like you know what I mean? And have the inside. best of both worlds sure. because when you go to resell it, I feel like there's extra value in the bracelet. Whether even if you don't like the bracelet. Let's say somebody offered this to me for a hundred bucks and I'm like, oh, I don't really like the bracelet. It's not my thing. I'd rather spend 80 bucks for, you know, one on a strap. If I look at it and say, well, for 10 bucks more, I'm keeping the bracelet and the rubber strap, I'm, I'm game. Yeah, I think it just makes a lot of sense. That's why I picked it at the end of the day. So before we started this, so Mark is always, you know, looking for his next watch to buy. He does have his own collection, unlike me. I don't have a collection. And, you know, Mark likes to buy a watch every 17 minutes on an average every time something new comes in. <laughs> of course, he pulls out the platinum Can't longer time myself. zone. And I'm glad you picked this one because this is actually for me. People will ask me, what is your favorite longer? This is one of my favorites. Specifically, I like the watch in platinum. I like the heft to it on the strap. And I think the time zone is, well, longer design in general is executed so perfectly. What's that triangle called? Yeah, the, you get the whole equilateral, the, the equilateral, equilateral triangle. The equilateral triangle and so on and so forth. And I like the way the time zone is executed on this. They were very, very often when I would travel, I would travel overseas to Hong Kong especially. I would always put on a longer time zone because I actually bothered reading the times on it whenever I would put on some other watch. I, I, for some reason, I never did. And I don't think it was due to the fact that I wanted to know what, especially with Hong Kong, it's a 12 hour difference. It's very easy to know at the top of your head. But I just like looking at the watch because aesthetically, it's super pleasing to me. But why did you pick it as an undervalued watch? I mean, I, so if you look at Longa's range, right? I think the Longa one definitely stands out as one underrated value. And if you look at the time zone specifically, I think it's one of those underrated value complications from Longa. Especially given the fact that, and we've mentioned this in an unboxing before, if you look at world time complications, all of them somewhat resemble a Patek Philippe world time, right? That's just what it 100%. is. You can't really redesign the world time complication, Listen, right? They named uh, Louis Cartier, not yeah. Cartier, but Cartier made it in yes. 1951. Something like that, like yeah. around the 50s, 50, yeah. 53 actually. 53. 51 was Vacheron in the pocket watch. That was the first one. Oh, yeah, Vacheron was the first one. Walking encyclopedia. Right? But uh, but uh, yeah, so so when you look at this world time complication, it's distinctly a long design. And that's what I really, really love about this. And and that's really what I'm it comes gonna add to. this to it. The world time complication for some reason across every brand is an undervalued watch. For yeah. some reason, people don't see the value in the world complication. For the life of me, I don't understand why. I think they're some of the prettiest watches. Look at the current paddock uh, world times with the Clause and A dollars. Oh my God. Or, you know, look, look at, if you look at a world time complication, even look at uh, the famed WWTC Gerard Perigo. Absolutely. Beautiful watch. Incredible Such value, value right? Yeah. And yet, 
for some reason, I don't know if it's the curse of the world time, I don't know if Cartier pissed somebody off 70 years ago, but something is up with this world time. The only, there's no world time watches out there that I've ever traded over list. I mean, forget the vintage stuff that fetched records, I get that. But yeah. and, and it's crazy because you'll even get like some Rolex GMTs will trade for uh, more than, a, for example, a Patek Philippe world time, which it's is crazy. Like that's it's crazy. crazy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna finish this off with an independent and oddly enough, I would say today, in terms of sales and popularity or value over lists and certain pieces, I think Jordan would be the leader at yeah, the point. Absolutely. And you went to the sports line. Yeah, and, I mean, and well, why is that? I think it's very, very obvious in the sense that if you think of FP Jordan, you're thinking of their kind of traditional watchmaking, right? You think FP Jordan, you see a particular watch, just like when you think of yeah, Mondo. you think of like the Tourbillon Souverain, the Resonance, uh, you know, maybe some other ones, Chronomet Optimum. Maybe you think of their Santi Graf. But I think for sure, without a doubt, one of the most underrated is their sports line. And, you know, I, I, I personally don't understand it because it has all the watchmaking of the Octa, right? It being officially a five day power reserve, but really it's closer to seven. But because uh, the last two days there's that drop off in amplitude, Jordan wants you to keep the watch wound so it keeps ample time or accurate timekeeping. And not to mention, I think it's such a unique and distinct format. We talked about bracelet design. No matter how comfortable it is. Yeah, comfortable, lightweight, aluminum movement, with the, which I think is so interesting. Aluminum dial also. Not to mention the, the distinct format of it. It's a super knockout watch. A quirky design, no doubt you love it or hate it, but I think it's just an awesome you watch. You know what I think it is? That watch versus any Octa, whatever, Octa, whatever. Uh, it's the difference between a Royal Oak and not code 1159, but Royal Oak and Royal Oak Offshore today. Because back in the day, it used to be the Offshore more popular than Royal Oak. Right. And that's what it is. It's like you, you, you get an AP, you get an Offshore, right? But you know the hottest, latest, greatest is something like this, right? Obviously, the Offshore is going to be much cheaper. And all of a sudden, you're like, ah, you know, it's great. I love it. It's still AP. It's still an Offshore. It's still a Royal Oak, but it's not quite the Royal Oak Chrono Blue Dial or 15202. Do you see what I mean? Like, yeah. it's not a difference between, like, say, a cold 11.59 and Royal Oak, but it's certainly that because, as you said, unmistakably, for those that know, will still know that that's a, that's a Jorn because it's a very distinct look in its own genre. But I've always felt that that was a great segue for FP Jorn to get into uh, a, the sports side. Right, the, the and most, they have to. Like, all watch brands have to have a sports watch to survive now. I, I, I had, uh, I was at uh, Moser yesterday, so they opened up a, um, they call it Moser Land. It's basically a flagship it, boutique. It's not a boutique. It's 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 a lounge, okay. right? So it's it's located on the twenty fourth or twenty fifth floor of a building in New York City in Midtown. Beautiful views, humongous windows, uh, very light, bright. You have a bar, you have a couch. It's a very relaxed setup. A couple of offices behind a glass, uh, you know, door that you can see. Mm -hmm. uh, very open, very spacious, very light and bright, comfortable. You know, you don't get that overwhelming experience of walking into a boutique on Madison, right? Sure. Comfortable space. And one of the things we discussed, and one of the things I told Claudio, who's the guy that runs the, uh, the New York USA distribution, is I told him, I think out of all the companies out there, one of the hardest things that major brands have, and I don't care if they've been around for 20 years or 120 years, one of the hardest things for a brand that's predominantly a dress brand is to transition into a sports line. I mean, Longa. The Brigade. This, the, uh, Brigade, <laughs> so, right? Brigade, like Brigade, Blanc Brigade. Blanc Blanc. It's so, yeah, so difficult for these, so for these companies to do so. Mm -hmm. And I think out of all the brands out there, there are two that I think made a seamless transition that, per, in my opinion, you may think otherwise and comment below, is Jorn and Moser. If you look at their streamline, that went off without a hitch. Yeah. It's pop, and, and nobody, nobody, because the biggest issue when you're talking about hardcore followers of Brigade, Olanga, uh, they are, they could never see themselves wearing a bulky, sportier watch, even though it's from the brand that they love, which is why nine out of 10 times, these companies have been around for years, all of a sudden come, come out with something in a sportier genre and it, it flops. Right. Brigade tw Type 20, 21, 22, all of them flop. Yeah. Uh, they came close with the Brigade Marine Chrono because it was still a gold watch, it was Big bigger and rubber, but they, they took advantage of bigger and better market at the time mm -hmm. that they did it. The minute they put that on a bracelet, nobody bought them, it yeah. was hideous. Yeah. Jorn did it well, and I think Moser did it well with their streamliner. And now the funny part is, is they're taking their dressier stuff and they're making it even more sportier. Like their heritage line, the, the pilot looking one. Sure. They don't actually, they discontinue them. But so Jorn, I think definitely succeeded. And again, it's still, you're still gonna have that. 
difficult transition. Yeah. It's just, it's, listen, it's inherent. Because there's also a flex factor, right? With Jordan, the flex factor is the octo look from afar. You can tell it's a Jordan. But it's, it's not even just that, right? You have to figure price point. When you think about Jordan, it's become a more common brand, right? It's not very niche anymore. I think they have a brand they're pretty established in the watch community. Uh, for the most part. But Again, that community is still a lot smaller. But it's not just that. Think about the price point this trades at, right? We're talking about the 60s, mid 60s versus something like a Royal Oak, an Aquanaut versus a Gold Rolex, Gold Daytona. You know what I'm saying? There's so, the, the competition the, at that price point is very, very it's high. Funny, that's the conversation I had with Claudia yesterday uh, is I told him, I said, if you look at independence across, which is what they are, mm -hmm. And I consider them a true because they literally make everything to include their own hair springs. Like they make everything, yeah. right? I told them, you know what? The one thing that I'll compliment you on, it's approachable. They yeah. start at 14. There's no, the price give me, point is give so me an independent that starts at $14,000. It doesn't exist. No, there, there are, but they're, they're not like big name independents who but make you, fully in-house watches. If you tell me Chappic right now, we'll end this video no, right no, no, now. No. <laughs> but but you're, you're absolutely right. The, the idea being they're so much more approachable. The price point of a Jorn is so Did you see so their skeleton turbion? It start, that's $84,000? Yeah. It's, well, it's bonkers. And you can pick it up nowadays like at 50 off retail though. That's the yeah, On a secondary market? Well, you know what? The gap between, how about this? Traditionally, the gap between buying something at list from an independent, if you go back just as short as five years, to include my favorite MBNF, was always, oh, I paid $100, it goes back on a secretary, I got 20. That gap has since shrunk Strongly tremendously. Enough, and yeah. some Moser models are trading not that far off of their retail prices on the secondary as a pre owned watch. And that's the sign. Because a lot of people, consumers and brands alike, make the misconception when identifying the value of a watch. And that's just the bottom line, and I'll end it with this. Value of a watch, when somebody comes to me and says, hey, I wanna sell you this watch X, and they're gonna say, I paid $100,000 for it, I, I paid full retail in boutique with tax, and so on and so forth, and I offer them $80,000. I say, oh, it's not bad, it's great. I watch the trace goes to retail. Well, then I'll offer them 30, and they're like, oh my God, that's so such a big loss. That watch is worth that much less, secondary? No. And I keep telling this to people, it's not that. It's the return on investment over time. If I know it's gonna take me six months to sell this watch versus six minutes, like with a Rolex, on average, yeah, we should do that. We should see how, how long we sell a Rolex on average. We should yeah. put a clock up somewhere. Yeah. But if it's gonna take me longer, that just means I'm paying for it less because I need to get a proper return. Otherwise, I am not making money or I'm losing money, right? right? Losing if the money is it's frozen. It's opportunity cost. It's opportunity cost, thank you. So when people hear things like I paid 100 and I'm giving you 30, doesn't mean the watch is worth 30 because I may very well be selling it for 65, 70, even just may take me nine months. Guys, mm -hmm. that got away quickly. We just got went from unboxing to talking about something else. But <laughs> Marco, thank you for joining me. We'll see you next week.